All right. So well, it looks like we can get started here. Um, so it's a pretty small group. So if you have any questions at all, I mean, I think the most important thing about this talk is to actually get your questions answered. It's not very often where you can actually get in a small group like this and, and ask whatever questions you want. So um, don't hesitate to interrupt. Raise your hand. Most important thing is to ask questions. More important than getting through the slide deck. Okay. So. Uh, one thing I like about these old dated pictures is they have a little bit more hair and a lot less gray, so it's kind of nice. I'm going to tell my practice to keep uh, keep this one up. So, so this is the program disclosures. I don't have any disclosures at all. Um, so the basic question is, what is inflammatory bowel disease? The simplistic uh, answer is it's just a chronic uh, relapsing inflammation of the GI tract. Ulcerative involves just the colon and rectum, basically, and then Crohn's is really anywhere from your mouth to your anus, actually. So it can be upper GI tract, small bowel, uh, and colon, and there's a few percent of cases that are indeterminate. So how common is IBD? Um, you know, it's actually become more common. Uh, so in 1999, 1.8 million people had it. Now about 1.2% of the population or 2.1 million people have it. Olmstead County is where Mayo is, so a lot of our research comes out of uh, Olmstead County and Mayo. Um, you can see the prevalence since 1965 kind of steadily increased uh, all the way up to 2011. It's even higher now. So big question when people come into clinic is what causes IBD? Um, probably the biggest thing is I wish we knew exactly, but we don't. Um, really, IBD is a, is dysregulated, a dysregulated immune system to kind of commensal microbiome or bacteria with some uh, genetic component or genetic susceptibility. So probably the, the second sentence there is the best. It's the development of IBD involves complex genetic, environmental, epithelial, microbial, and immune factors. So it's a big complex disease. Uh, we're learning more and more about it every year, but we don't know exactly what the trigger is, thus we can't remove the exact trigger to make it better. So inflammatory bowel disease is actually a, a disease of the post-industrial revolution. So it didn't really exist before that. But when we started to put people into cities close together, build sanitation systems, change the way their food got to them, took them off of farms, all of a sudden you started to see ulcerative colitis and then Crohn's disease. Uh, places like China, India, the Middle East, that their westernization or industrialization is behind ours, are now seeing Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, has become an epidemic in their countries as well. So as I just said, something happened when we took people off the farms and put them into close quarters. So there's there's environmental influences, both kind of macro environment that we all see, as well as micro environment, the microbiome that's lining the, the GI tract. Um, there certainly are dietary components. I don't have to go into a lot of that because there was a huge dietary talk right before this. Uh, and then a genetic component. From the genetic component, there are more, this is about a five-year-old slide actually, but the, there are, were 200 IBD kind of risk loci at that point. The, there's many more now, but kind of mapping the exact genome to say this is what type of IBD you're going to have, we're not quite there yet. In general, the risk, uh, which is what most people care about, is what's the risk to my family members? The risk for first degree relatives is kind of around 5% unless you have some particular uh, ethnicity. So. Uh, some other things to point out, uh, smoking increases the risk in Crohn's disease, decreases the risk for ulcerative colitis. Breastfeeding is really important. It's protective for both. Um, oral compre uh, contraceptives can increase the risk. Um, so low vitamin D levels can increase the risk as well. So oftentimes people ask, well, what's the difference between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis besides the locations which I just talked about? So this is a nice slide from John Hopkins where you know you can see the normal bowel uh, on the left side, and then you can see if I can zoom in here. So the bowel is a fancy uh, it's mural inflammatory process. So it involves uh, the whole wall is involved in the inflammatory process. Compared to ulcerative colitis, where you just get the surface is involved uh, with the inflammatory process. There are subtypes of Crohn's disease, uh, and also we kind of divide it up as far as locations as well. So there's an inflammatory subtype, and so that's just where you have active inflammation in the bowel, causing some edema, swelling, the ulcerations, whatnot. Uh, the inflammatory type can progress to uh, fibrospinotic or stenosing disease. Um, those can ultimately progress to obstructions and other complications. 
And then there is a penetrating type or, or fistulizing disease, which is these are little inflammatory tracts that kind of come off the GI tract. Um, those can cause, can be a big problem. Those are probably impact quality of life the most. In general, the locations is kind of the rule of, of thirds. So one third is right around where the small bowel connects to the, the colon, right at the cecum that where this picture shows. About a third are just in the ileum, about a third are uh, in the colon, and then there's a small percentage that are up the GI tract. So unfortunately, Crohn's disease can occur outside of the GI tract as well, or cause problems outside of the GI tract. In general, the list of questions that we ask when we come into clinic is, do you have any eye problems, oral problems, skin problems, or joint problems? Those are the most common places where you can get some eye inflammation, you can get oral sores, uh, joint disease and, and joint pain is very common. There are some other things like kidney stones that can occur. There's an inflammatory condition in the, the bile that's called primary sclerosis and cholangitis. So it can kind of wreak havoc outside the GI tract too, unfortunately. So how do you diagnose Crohn's disease? You know, basically we we listen well to all the patient's symptoms and, and the process of trying to narrow down, hey, what's going on here? I think Crohn's is going on here is, is really kind of twofold. We're trying to figure out, do you have Crohn's, but also do you have complications of Crohn's? So do you have a low blood count? Do you have malnutrition? Do you have inflammatory markers? The, the two biggest things, uh, modalities that we use to really help diagnose Crohn's is colonoscopy, which I'll show you some pictures. Um, sometimes we have to use that pill camera or capsule endoscopy of the small bowel. Um, and then the CT scan and MRIs are really important to, to identify small bowel disease as well as uh, determine if there's any complications too. So these are pictures. Uh, the upper left, um, this is uh, in the ileum, and that's a very typical Crohn's ulcer there. Um, in the colon here, it's hard to see sometimes with the light, but this is a big ulcer there, and this is really more clear. This is in the colon as well. Really deep ulcers there kind of lining the colon. So I use pictures a lot um, in clinic because I think it's very hard for humans to kind of conceptualize, like, you want me to take this huge, you know, long list of side effects and risks, um, and I don't even see what's going on with me. So I think it helps to kind of see this is actually what's going on in the GI tract. This is kind of how bad it looks. We want to get to the point where we actually heal it up. So it does kind of help justify or explain, hey, this is what's going on with me. So before we get into treatment of Crohn's, I really got to start with the, the risk of Crohn's. As I just said, a lot of our treatments, which you all know, actually come with these risk, you know, lists of side effects, which actually they're safer than the list would suggest. However, it's still a scary list for people that have never been, been on medications before. So you really have to lay out the discussion like what can happen to you with your Crohn's disease. So there's a lucky 20 to 30 percent that have a non-progressive uh, course, meaning they, they really don't get that sick over time, don't just have surgery. About 50 to 80 percent of people start out in that inflammatory subtype, so there's just inflammation going on there. There's not the, the strictures or the fistulas. However, a little over half of them in 20 years develop those complications. There's about a 20% risk of perianal fistulas. So these are where those little inflammatory tracts kind of come around the anal canal. Now you get stool leaking, you know, when you don't want it leaking, you get infections down there. Um, really can impact your quality of life quite a bit. And we, all of our treatments probably treat that the least, actually. So those are the hardest things to treat. So you've got a one in four chance of that. 80% of patients will be hospitalized. If you get corticosteroids, this is all pre-biologic, but you, roughly half of those patients will be steroid dependent, steroid refractory, or get a resection the next year. So really, once you get prednisone or some sort of corticosteroid, it's really a hallmark of, hey, we need to do something else here because there's a risk for you to have a pretty significant disease in the future, okay? Um, this is uh, the, the surgery data. So before all of our biologics, we had around a 50% 10-year risk of surgery. After biologics, we've dropped it to 30%. I feel like over the next decade or so, we'll get that down even lower. I mean, the, the first decade or more of, of biologic therapy, we really weren't using it as well as we could. And I think now we've really honed in on how we optimize biologics and, and honed in on how we manage Crohn's disease. So uh, after you have a surgery, you have a one-third chance of getting another surgery um, in the next 10 years. And then clinically, half of patients will have a recurrence of symptoms uh, at the five-year mark. So this is a great slide. Um, it really, I 
show this to patients uh, intermittently when they're really kind of wondering why am I doing this. Um, so if you uh, take a look at this line here, this is kind of the clinical flare. So it's going up, you flare, and then you feel better, and you're like, oh, I'm out of this, and then you flare, and then I feel better. Um, unfortunately, the whole time that this little inflammatory cycle is going on, you're progressively laying down scar and stricture. So that process of active inflammation, you know, you start out here, you're inflamed, a little bit of scar, more inflammation, a little bit of scar, you progressively narrow and get a, a stricture in the bowel. Um, and then ultimately, in front of those strictures, you can get these little fistulas or abscess that can occur, and then you need surgery. So this is kind of the, if you know, if we didn't treat with biologics, this is where you progress. You know, you have all the complications, and then you get surgery, and then it, you just restart the clock again. And this is where we were probably 30, 40 years ago. So there really is a role that if we can catch people early and get them on the right treatment, um, and get them, and, and from our standpoint, paying attention to the, the inflammatory process closely, like keeping a close eye on what's going on in their body, and maintaining tight control, we can actually prevent all these complications up there. So this is really the goal, is to right after diagnosis, is to get you on the right treatment and, and do the right thing after that. Uh, Non-pharmacologic treatment. I start with this because, in general, this is something that patients can control. It's something that they're interested in. In fact, a lot of patients would like to just be able to control their Crohn's disease with this. It's almost a uniform uh, feeling, which I feel the same way. I don't really want to take drugs either. However, you have to understand that, you know, a lot of this is out of your control. You were born in a post-industrial revolution. You, it's just a, it's nothing you did to bring the disease on you. And reality is we don't know all the specific triggers, so there's, you can't hone in completely and control it completely with without using some help from the from the medicine. But the the other treatments are helpful. So we have this dine. I won't go into fiber because we had a deep, deep dive on fiber. I thought that was impressive. Um, but this dine trial, uh, this was really the first time that we had good, uh, some good evidence that, hey, when, when people do a very um, healthy diet, no processed foods, no sugars, all that stuff, or less processed foods, less sugars, you can get people into a clinical remission 45% of the time. So we compared this Mediterranean diet to the uh, carbohydrate-specific diet. In general, since there's no difference between the two in outcomes in that trial, I usually recommend Mediterranean diet. A Mediterranean diet has much more data for uh, prevention of Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, uh, coronary artery disease, so, uh, and it's also easier to maintain. It's kind of the diet that all humans probably should be on anyways. Um, so. And in and, and our clinic, we have dietitians, usually in all these uh, uh, clinics in town here that have IBD specialists, they have, they have dietitians that can help you get on that Mediterranean diet more uh, strictly. You have to quit smoking, there's no question about it. Um, early data on infliximab or Remicade, you know, if you didn't smoke, you had about a 75% chance of responding. If you were a smoker, you had 25% chance of responding. So it makes a huge difference in how you respond to the biologics. We oftentimes use antibiotics for mainly for perianal disease. The antidiarrheas, we, like Lamotil or Imodium, we will introduce those, but a little bit cautiously, we got to have a full understanding of what's going on in the GI tract first. Complementary medicine, I'm totally in support of it, actually. Uh, we don't have a magic pill that can cure everything. The one caveat to comp complementary medicine is, you know, we don't, we don't always know actually what's in the medicines. Um, nothing goes to the FDA. The claims they make are not always uh, rigorously tested, so these are the cautions there. Um, from a probiotic standpoint, I think if you're going to go in the complementary, comp complementary medicines, I think that's a good way to kind of wade into it. Um, the pain control, really try to avoid ibuprofen. It can increase the risk of flares. Uh, narcotics have been shown to have worse outcomes, so we try to avoid that as well. So sometimes you need it, but we try to avoid it if we can. So the non-biologic treatments, I'm going to kind of roll through this a little quickly, so if there's any questions, let me know. But the amino salicylates, this is the sulfasalazine, mesalamine, lialda. The mesalamine, lialda, they do not work, so you really shouldn't be on those. There is a small section of mild Crohn's patients that may get a little symptomatic relief, but they do not work to prevent the natural history of Crohn's. So the vast, vast majority of patients should not be on them. Sulfasalazine is minimally effective. Corticosteroids, those are flare medications. They actually have our highest risk of all the drugs that we use with corticosteroids. However, they're one of our best flare medications. So when you're actively flaring, they can get you uh, into a remission. 
at a high frequency and get you feeling better so that we can get you on something else that, that works better and has less risk. Immunomodulators, these were used for decades, uh, 6MP, APHI, and methotrexate. Um, over the last probably five to eight years or so, these have kind of fallen out of favor, at least for, for monotherapy or therapy alone. Um, probably the biggest role for these now are just to combine with something like infliximab, which is Remicade. And I'll try to use the generics because now we have all these biosimilars. So, uh, but I'll just, people are more tuned into some of the, the brand names. So I'll kind of sprinkle that in too. But so oftentimes the use of these are with infliximab or Remicade or adalimumab or Humira for real, uh, you know, severe disease. So let's get into the biologics. Um, there's the three kind of originals. Uh, the anti-CNS biologics are infliximab, adalimumab, or cedalizumab. And the, the initial trade, or, uh, brand names were uh, Remicade, Humira, and Syngia. So you can see this huge list of risks. Okay, so that's super scary for everybody. What you have to understand is the drugs perform, yes, these risks are real. They are all fairly rare. And the drugs perform really well. They're one of the, the main drugs that can actually heal uh, the mucosa. Um, and the vast, vast majority of people tolerate them really well without problems. So really kind of the hurdle uh, is getting people, you know, understanding the full risks of your disease and getting over this hurdle of, you just told me all this stuff that and I should take it now, you know. So that's kind of what we do in clinic every day is kind of explaining that, hey, these risks of your disease are much worse than these risks of these medications. The, despite the fact that it's very specific, so it just blocks this one cytokine, TNF-alpha, it actually has a lot of impact on your uh, immune system, which is why it's so powerful. Uh, the next biologic is um, uh, the anti-integrin. So I bring this up. Uh, the main one that we use is actually vitalizumab, but I bring up natalizumab just because um, these, these anti-integrins kind of block white cells from getting to the end organ. And the first anti-integrin was this natalizumab that blocked white cells from going to your brain and going to your gut. So it worked for uh, Crohn's disease. However, um, unfortunately, there's kind of this ubiquitous virus, JC virus, that when you're on this medication and you get infected with JC virus, you can get this degenerative brain condition called PML. So people with MS so that are still ha that are having, you know, construction of their brain were like, I'm okay, I'll take it. But people with Crohn's are like, no, thank you. I don't need any other problems added to my plate. So um, so vitalizumab, and the reason I bring it up is that the FDA actually put the PML warning on vitalizumab, and it really shouldn't happen with vitalizumab. Vitalizumab is a, is a gut-specific anti-integrin, so you're really not immunosuppressing the rest of your body, you're just immunosuppressing uh, the GI tract. Um, so it's really a great phenomenon in modern medicine. Um, and they haven't really seen any GC, uh, JC virus reactivation or PML with it. That's also one of our lowest risk biologics. So a little bit newer than the, the, um, the delizumab and the adalimumab and infliximab is this, is this bitinumab, which has been out quite a while. That's Solara. And then uh, just this year is uh, Rizantizumab, which is Skyrezi, which was just approved this year as well. So they're similar in that they, they impact kind of the same area on IL-23. These are called IL-12, IL-23 blockers, or just an IL-23 blocker. So you'll see a bunch of other names here. These are not FDA approved yet. Uh, Rizantizumab is, but these are the other drugs kind of in the process of getting approval and the, in the trial. So um, the nice thing about these is they have a very good efficacy. So they they actually, there's a study with Ustinumab that with Adalimumab, it has an equivalent efficacy. So very high efficacy, and they actually have less risk than the infliximab and the Adalimumab, okay? All right, I still bring out combination therapy. So this is uh, from 12 years ago. So this article is a landmark article in GI or in IBD care in which they combined uh, infliximab with uh, azathioprine in a public sonic trial. And this was really the first time that we got to remission rates close to 60% was with it. Um, you can see infliximab alone was kind of in the 40% remission rate. And honestly, most of these meds, particularly infliximab, adalimumab, and ustinumab, kind of are in that roughly 40% remission rate in the trials. I think we get higher levels of remission when we start to optimize them, increase the dose, check the levels. Um, but it, 
this despite the fact of being a little bit older, uh, um, you know, medical treatment with the, the combination therapy, it's still one of our standards for the most severe patients. So we still combine the azathioprine with infliximab if you have severe disease, crystallizing disease. So we still use it quite a bit. Now, I, this is one of my last slides. Um, I just put this in here because oftentimes you're just, it's like a numbers or alphabet soup. You're just kind of like throwing out this anti CNF, anti IL 12, IL 23. And quite honestly, really a fair number of my GI, dental GI partners may not even understand how these things work that well. But I think from a patient standpoint, kind of understand that, you know, this is, uh, this is the lumen. So this is where all the microbiome is. This is your epithelial barrier. And here's where the blood cells are going through. So, this is kind of where the magic happens. This is where these drugs are working is right in the right in the wall of that in that GI tract, okay? And they have multiple pathways. There's multiple other drugs on here, including ulcerative drugs, but it's a nice thing to kind of characterize that this is, you know, your problem is right there and these drugs are targeting right there. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, this is the newest guideline uh, from 2021 from ADA, which is our national organization. And the reason to spend some time is that, you know, these are the patients that actually should be on biologics, okay? So if you have large, uh, deep mucosal lesions, if you have fistula, abscess, strictures, any of the complications from Crohn's that we talked about, prior refractions, extensive distributions, and what that means is it's not a quick, easy surgical fix. If your whole colon is involved or if you have a lot of small bowel involved, we can't just take that part out, even though it usually comes back after that anyways. Uh, but if you have a low blood count, elevated inflammatory markers like CRP, low albumin indexing, possibly some malnutrition, steroid use, as we talked about, you don't improve on some of the meds we've already tried to use, um, or it's significantly impacting your activity of daily living, these are when we should be using the biologics to try to get your life back, try to heal the colon, uh, heal the small bowel, so we can kind of put Crohn's in a rear view mirror. So, I'm going to sum up this slide a little quicker because I heard the, the applause over there so we don't go too long. Um, this is also part of the guideline. And basically, I'll sum it up rather than reading word for word. But the first uh, statement is really use biologics early. Okay, don't wait for people to fail corticosteroids. We already know they're going to fail corticosteroids down the road if, after they get off of it. It may work initially, but they're going to fail it down the road. Um, don't wait for them to fail a drug that doesn't work for five ASAs. Uh, for it. So the minute somebody starts on steroids, we're having discussions about let's get you on the right treatment. This is how risky your disease is. Let's get you on the right treatment to get you healed up and get your life back. Um, they recommend the use of biologics over immunomodulators, particularly for induction. The immunomodulator takes a couple of months to work. Um, but in general, falling in favor has been the use of, the use of biologics first line. Uh, there are some studies that, that would suggest that perhaps azathioprine 6 mt monotherapy alone for Crohn's is not super uh, effective. So, um, so biologics are kind of where it's at to start. Um, if you have not been on biologics, I would say just from a efficacy standpoint, you know, infliximab, adalimumab, and sapinumab are the ones that are more efficacious than Crohn's disease, where vitalizumab is just a little bit lower, and sertilizumab is lower than that. Um, if you have, you've got put on infliximab and Humira and you don't respond to it right away, don't try the other one. So if it was infliximab, don't try, and you fail it right away, don't try adalimumab. Go on to something else. Go on to a different mechanism like eustatinumab. And then um, this, the, the statement actually does recommend if you have not been on either treatment, try the combination therapy. I would say in practice more often that gets reserved to, for people that are really on that severe spectrum. I think you're in, if you're in kind of the lower end of the moderate to severe, we're going to try biologic first. Uh, and then the final thing is if you have an active perianal fistula or um, without an abscess, they actually recommend the use of antibiotics with the biologic for the first 12 weeks, I think. So that will give you the best chance of healing up that fistula. So, all right. Well, thank you for your time.